Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. You're all very, very welcome to today's event, where we are celebrating International Women's Day 2021. The theme for this year is Choose to Challenge, and Retina International are honoured to welcome an esteemed panel of women from across the Retina community here today. So we have an, an amazing esteemed panel of researchers, advocates, and clinicians and we are very, very excited to celebrate and honor their stories and experiences. Moderating today's panel will, of course, be Dr. Orla Galvin, who is the Director of Research and Policy here at Retina International. And without further ado, I am delighted to pass over to Orla. Thank you, Fiona. So yes, we are very fortunate today to be joined by a panel of patient advocates, scientists, and clinical researchers so for our audience, this panel of seven super women are representative of the many key stakeholders who are actively engaged and working to support the needs of the rest in the community across the globe. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Mrs. Marina Slitter-Pence, who is a patient advocate and the interim chair of the rest of the Youth Council. Uh, Re um, Marina is joining us from Switzerland today, but is also affiliated with New Zealand. We are joined also by Dr. Helen Dolphus, who is the coordinator of the European Reference Network, I, and is joining us from France. We are joined also by Dr. Husbani Sundara Murthy, who is a postdoctoral researcher at BioRepairia in Sweden, and she is based there very recently, moving in the middle of a pandemic, seconded from UCD in Ireland. We are joined by our very own uh, Miss Christina Fasser, who is of course the patient advocate and the former president of Retina International, also joining us from Switzerland today. We are joined by Dr. Abigail Fahim, who is a clinical assistant professor at the Kellogg Research Eye Center in Michigan, USA, and Dr. Suzanne Rusing, who is an assistant professor at the Bradbound University Medical Center in the Netherlands. And last but not least, we are also joined by Mrs. Laura Fietta, who is a patient advocate based from the United Kingdom. So in advance of today, we have invited our panelists to consider their pathway to their current role in supporting the retina community. So for the first part of the panel discussion, we are inviting each of our panelists to spend three or four minutes sharing with you, our audience, their pathway. And considering in this pathway where any female role models or mentors would have guided the, or inspired them, any particular events or timelines where they or other women have perhaps been oppressed in pursuing their chosen pathway, where their voices may have been undervalued or alternatively carried greater weight because they were a woman. And if they have noticed the impact of the drive for women to pursue careers in STEM, so in science, technology, engineering, and maths, at any time in developing their current role. So in the first instance, I'm going to hand over now to Mrs. Marina Slutter-Pence. Thank you, Orla. Now, when I think back, when you asked me to consider how I came to this point, being both about to start my master's in health promotion, but also as a patient advocate for Retina International, I cannot say it was a easy, straightforward path. As we spoke about in an interview many months ago, my, my pathway has been very strange. It started off when I was 16. I was in high school and I knew with absolute certainty that I wanted to work in health science. I had a passion for working with people because as a young girl, I had so many supportive people who were there advocating for me. And I thought, that's me, I wanna do that. And so I think it's great to, I feel very fortunate. I have had so many role models in my life, fem female and other, and men as well. But I think the most prominent female role models I can think about are my mother, she has always pushed. She never let me sit down and say, okay, that's enough. She always said, try harder, go for that next big goal. Then I had the most amazing auntie and 
flatmate who encouraged me when I was stagnating, she said, when are you going to start the degree? And I went, I don't know, someday, maybe. And she went, no, 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 you, you, are, you are going to go online right now and register. And I did. And it was amazing. I chose exactly the right degree at the right time. It led me to do placements and practicum placements in Health Alliance at my the National Blind Foundation in Auckland. And through these various pathways, I built my skills as both an advocate and as an investigator of the natural world. And I think the main role model, the main thing that I've taken away from my journey of where I, from starting at 16, where I was inspired to today, where I'm 26, about to be 27, it's to be consistent. It's to be ever present because a lot of the, the moments that were really important that led me to where I am today was chance because I was persistent, because I kept talking to people because I never lost that passion. I was available for the chances, especially for Rational International. I would like to say that the role models and the women involved in Rational International absolutely inspire me. I feel fully supported. I feel involved, engaged, and I am never afraid to participate. And while I have not experienced any oppressive or negative experiences in my in the building of my career. I know that my mother and other women had such events where men in their environment or other women as well actually would push them down or minimize their value. And so, yeah, my goal is to, as a female leader, to never do that to other women who also choose leadership. I. I would like to advocate not only for the youth as they move into their power, but also to advocate for the woman, regardless of age, of pursuing that dream of having their voice heard and having a purpose in life. Thank you, Marina. And I know there are a number of people who would share your opinions and um, actually even look up to you in your role. And we're very fortunate to have you as the chair of the Rational Youth Council at the moment. Um, Helen, I'm going to come to you next. And what you won't have heard is prior to you joining the call, I was mentioning that a number of messages came in from people who were just happy to have the opportunity to get to hear you speak because you, you definitely have a fan base um, whether that is from your clinic or from your coordination of the ERNI, I don't know, but you definitely have some fans tuning in today. Thanks. Thanks. So, so uh, in fact, uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. I, I'm really honored to be, to be among you. And uh, uh, so I, I discovered a little bit the topics just, just now, but I have a few... Uh, a few comments to do on uh, how women uh, can uh, uh, carry, I mean, can, can do a career in science and medicine, and uh, uh, also how, how women can support each other. So as the previous speaker, I would like to say that the first support is really our mothers. Uh, they were not people who were always working. So they really wanted to push the next generation, really, I think, to, to be engaged in work, uh, anyhow, for my generation. And uh, I think that was a, a, it's a tremendous support, this, this generation of females who are really uh, helping us all along in this, uh, in this long path at all the levels, especially when you become a mother and you need help with young children, for instance. So this is invaluable and it's really female solidarity. So uh, in, my, in my career, I always wanted to be a doctor. So this was something that was, must be genetic somewhere. Uh, I couldn't do anything else. And for vision, for me, it's the ophthalmology uh, field was something really fascinating with the uh, vision. And uh, uh, also the genetics was something that really interested me a lot. And I met a lot of mentors on my, on, in my, uh, 
uh, in my career and uh, a lot of mentors that were men and that were uh, actually very supportive for a female uh, career. I think, for instance, of Alan Bird or uh, Arnold Munich, these type of, of men were really supportive for, 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 for this type of career, but also female mentors. And I would like to, to mention here Jocelyne Kaplan, who uh, was who is a, a geneticist in uh, eye, rare eye diseases, and she really inspired me. I made her my first consultations next to her, and I thought she was speaking so well to the patients with a lot of compassion. And uh, she she really uh, was a mentor for me. Is a mentor for me. Now uh, along the career, it's not always easy as a female and you, you may bump into some, some, some strange situations. And just an example, uh, when I was going to uh, apply for my professor position uh, in France, there is a, a committee, a university committee that is, is mainly men. Uh, and the president called me and I can still now know 20 years uh, later where I was at that precise minute, I was in my car. And uh, he called me and he told me, well, um, what is your husband doing? So I, had, I told him, well, uh, he's a, a dentist and uh, okay. So then you don't need to have a position. And I was just so stunned. 10 years I had been working in studying medicine and you know, you just don't need an academic position. I was really uh, flattergasted, I must say. And um, also, uh, when you do an academic career, you always are um, screened for your production. You have to be productive. You have to publish all the time. And this is very, very difficult when you are a, a young mother or when you have a lot of, of, of work uh, uh, to do at home. And I always remember also a comment from my husband because I, when I had my second son, I said, oh, well, this year I have really not published anything is going to be a catastrophe and he told me well you published our son it's already <laughs> well done <laughs> so that was it always it always uh, struck me I thought yes indeed that was something good so anyhow the the pathways are really uh, not not easy and we can find always also a lot of female solidarity at various levels and for instance uh, I had a lot of colleagues um, as, young uh, when I was younger but also now who became very close friends because we really struggled together for different uh, uh, for different purposes and uh, I think this is this is very nice but also at the level of patient associations and I think uh, of Christina and uh, Avril really there are really a specific uh, um, uh, specific relationship that are established between us. And I think the, the female relationship here is very, uh, very important. So um, yes, it's not a, a straightforward path. Uh, there are some obstacles. And what I would like to say to the young uh, scientists, uh, the young women who get into science or who get into medicine, that they should not give up because I think uh, a lot of them are afraid to, to go forward. Um, uh, they see sometimes how it can be, uh, uh, how it can be uh, uh, not easy for uh, when you get senior in the pathway. And I really, uh, in my close environment, in my, where I see young MDs who, who sometimes hesitate to go into academia and to get more involved in science, and I really want to push them because I think it's really it's really worthwhile and it's really uh, rewarding by many means uh, on the human uh, point of view, but also on the personal and scientific uh, satisfaction you can get from this. So, yeah, my main uh, my main message would be here for all, all the females that that are young and that get into the academic career never give up and go forward so thank you that was the only comments i wanted to to give thank you thank you so much helen and you know when you're speaking about some of the young women scientists um and husbandy i'm coming to you next um it just reminded me of uh prior to this webinar in discussing what what might come up something husbandy said was that she's quite conscious of the fact that she's standing on the shoulders of giants, that it wasn't always 
as easy for women to pursue careers in science. And um, Husfani, I will hand over to you and you can tell us a little bit more about your career development. So hi, um, so I can actually repeat or mimic whatever uh, the rare two others have said. So it wasn't for my career per se with one individual role models, but it was actually a collection of different people that I actually en encountered, whether through my studies or during my career, or even when I'm actually outside interacting and even your circle of friends. And what for me that actually was quite important was uh, taking a specific attributes that I could relate with. And then I took that on as uh, being my path and how I would like to shape myself and my personality as well as my career and the drive in which I would like to go forward. It was, um, I started my PhD and to be honest, I didn't always knew I wanted to do a PhD. My undergrad supervisor, he said, oh, you should apply for a PhD. I was like, okay, <laughs> I will do that. So at that point, I know I loved being in the lab. I loved doing research work uh, more than anything else. I did not have a specific, let's say, a disease area or topic that I was interested in per se, but I was more doing molecular biology by training. So I went ahead, applied, and I, was, I got the opportunity to work. And then, so I'm originally from Singapore. So in Singapore, we don't apply to a particular project, but you kind of apply to the university in your specific department of field of interest. And then you get to rotate among different labs to choose your supervisor. So that kind of actually allowed me to see which is my research area of interest. And the first lab I did go into was with retinal research. And that I, after a month, I was like, okay, this is us. I do want to continue working here. I want to pursue this research over here. So that's how I ended up um, doing a postdoc afterwards as well in the retinal field of research. So I've always been a molecular biologist and with basic research, but then I, when I moved to Dublin for my first postdoc with Brendan, that's when I moved into translational medicine and I realized that was very meaningful to me in terms of pursuing my research. And that's how I'm now working on ocular oncology aspect of it and in a translational medicine. But what I want to add, put forward here is that there's no right or wrong answer in the path you would like to choose. If you, in the beginning is still okay, you can find your way as you go along. But what is very important over here is having a mentor who can and it's able to guide you along the way and push you. And you need to be able to persevere for yourself and try. I think, um, I think Husfani has Sorry. frozen. Oh, you're, you're back, yeah. you're back, yes. <laughs> Husfani, I just wanted to ask you to maybe comment on, um, I know when we were discussing this before you were speaking about the opportunities that moving away from Singapore to Western Europe uh, provided. And I just, you know, I'm coming after you for a statistic, the, the statistic of um, the group of people who were selected as part of that Top Med 10 program that um, allowed you to pursue your PhD, if you could share that with our audience. Yes, yeah, so after my Viva, I actually I got in contact with Brandon and then he told me that there is an um, opening for a funding call, which is with the Mercury Fellowship, and that's with Top Met 10, UCD Top Met 10 program. So in this program, they wanted to, uh, it's specifically for personalized medicine and translational medicine in across any research field in biology. And when we applied, it's open to all kinds of candidates, right? Anyone who is the best could get. And after the funding, when I actually was successful in getting it and then went to meet my peers in this top med 10 group, what stood out was eight of us were females. So there was a total of nine candidates that were selected for this program across two different grant calls. And eight of us were females and there was only one male who made the cut. So what is striking here is that actually a lot of females are dominating or being successful in getting 
infrastructural fellowship and funding. But as you go along, you realize what happens to them. Why is not many females in the higher ranking positions that you could look up to and have, uh, you know, interaction or guidance. So it's more than 50%, or we want equal balance between the gender, right? But it's more than 50% is always being male and you have uh, lesser females in these high leading roles, unfortunately. Well, we're, we're hopeful that with statistics like that, with more and more women entering into uh, the academic pathways, that perhaps that, that equilibrium of equal measures will one day be reached. Um, so another lady who is very familiar with the changing roles of women over the course of time is going to be our next speaker, Christina Fasser. So it is my, my great pleasure to hand over to Christina to tell us about some of the changes and the challenges and, and the great achievements that women have made over the past number of decades. Christina, over to you. Thank you very much, Orla. Yes, indeed. Uh, I started my professional life nearly 50 years ago. And the world at that time was completely different. Switzerland just got the voting right for women. So I went on the street together with a lot of women to claim our right to vote. So a very early as a woman, we were very clear we had to walk against discrimination. As a woman with a disability, I had uh, even double discrimination to face. I had to face the discrimination of a disabled person, which at that time was looked at as something that everybody knows what she or he has to do, and they don't are living in their own rights, etc. So this was a very different time, and only in the early 80s, this started to change with the movement of the independent living, which started out in Berkeley and ended with the global year for the people with, of the people with disability. Please note, of the people, not for the people. So this changed completely our attitudes. And when I got involved in the patient advocacy in the 79, at that moment, patient advocacy was something like rebellion against the system because the system was very hierarchic. Doctors knew what patient needed and patient had to accept what the doctor said to point it out very harshly. But we were welcome as patient. When I started in this patient movement, I must say in the Retina International community, we were very privileged because we were a number of women, which were great leaders. I think about Linda Drummond Walker, Maria van der Saar, my dear friend Claudette Medefint, uh, Helma Kusek. These were the women that marked Latina International and marked the growing up of the organizations. And thus, we had already a very good female network, but we were never men against women, women against men. In this community, I must say, we lived at the beginning the discriminations of researchers and doctors against the patients, because it was a different world. But with working, we earned our acceptance. And with the time working over nearly 50 years together, you get also a very clear what everybody is doing and earn your respect. And as Helen said, we as women, we have to work hard and we have, we have to accept it at the moment. We still have work to work harder than our male companions need to do. But what I also learned is as a woman leader, once I had earned the respect of men, I got their loyalty and I got their loyalty over many, many years. And I think we have to be aware of that, that without the men being loyal to us as female leader, we wouldn't have gone where we are now. But we have also to do ourselves 
things. I think it's very important that we look out, when we do a program, for instance, that we look out, what's the balance? Do we have enough women? Do we have enough men? Sometimes now we start even to look at, oh, there are not enough men, because we have such a great network of women now that we think of them and we are working together. So in order to get it more equal, I think we have now to start to see the other way. But we have also to be very clear. We women are not just there. We have still to be very careful and to make sure to introduce ourselves and to get into the positions and to dare to take them. To know what the communication is different how men behave when they apply for a job and how we behave. And I think this is something that is even stronger depending your culture. When I see how English, native English speaker, American English people, even women are going ahead when they are presenting themselves and how we as Swiss or German or French would do it, we are much more modest and we have to learn a little bit to more frank and also a little bit to put on our shoulders ourselves. But I think together we can do this. We have to be aware of the discrimination. We have especially be aware of the discri double discriminations that women with disability face. But uh, on the other hand, we went a long way and that we have these meetings and this webinar that's already a big achievement. So let us encourage ourselves, but let us not to forget to take along also our male friends. Absolutely, Christina. And thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'm gonna pick up on one of the words that you used there a little bit, and, and that was striking a balance. And I think in this day and age, women are certainly not confined to pursuing just uh, one particular avenue when it comes to their careers. And indeed, when they are patient advocates, that could be one part of their job as well. But similarly, um, when we speak to some of the our wonderful panelists here, and, and Abby, I'm coming to you next, is the idea of how to manage things like you know, the clinical practice, but then also wanting to engage in research as well. Um, and perhaps you could share with us a little bit of um, your decision making and, and around um, the balance of spreading your time between research and clinical practice and, and how that, um, how your role came about. Uh, yeah, so thank you. I mean, so many of the things that have been said so far have really resonated with me. Um, I am a clinician and a scientist, um, and I, clinically, I just see patients with inherited retinal diseases. And the way I came to that was initially through the science in college. I had um, an interest in science and specifically genetics and wanted to pursue a PhD in genetics. And uh, it was through meeting with a counselor, you know, we were all assigned to, you know, college career counselors, and it was, it was a woman, and she said, you know, you really should do an MD-PhD, and uh, much like Hestony, I was like, okay, you know, I was very um, young and impressionable and suggestible, I was like, oh, that sounds great, you yeah. know, um, and so I did that, and, uh, and did a PhD in genetics, and um, then in my clinical years, really enjoyed ophthalmology and discovered this whole um, subspecialty within ophthalmology, this whole genetic subspecialty that uh, of all of these different inherited retinal diseases um, that was just ripe for therapeutic advances and really needed to be, you know, some advances in the field. I said, that's, that's what, that's what I need to do. Um, and so that's, that's what I do now. But um, uh, yeah, to, to address some of the questions within that, um, you know, I, I have had, as many of the others, a combination of male and female mentors along the way. Um, and uh, you know, so one of my um, greatest female mentors currently has been Deborah Thompson at, at Kellogg, who's a, a researcher and 
cloned the RPE65 gene many years ago, which is, was, is now the first gene mm -hmm. to have an FDA approved gene therapy. Um, and she works very closely with me and my science and data and sort of nitpicking grants and, and things like that. And so really that's that side-by-side -side, um, mentorship. Um, but there are also, we're really lucky in ophthalmology to have lots of great female role models. Um, you know, it is, it is still true that, you know, what some of the other women have said, you know, as you, and the data shows it and there's a whole literature about it, how we have women entering at the ground level. And then, you know, it just gets challenging to be productive academically when you're being productive with your family. So, um, and so as things go on, it's, you don't have as many women, but in ophthalmology, we have a number of female uh, department chairs, um, one of our own at Kellogg, Simon Roy, who's also a clinician scientist, recently became the chair at Ohio State. And there's uh, Joan Miller at Harvard and Julia Holler at Wills. And so there are a number of female uh, role models. And, um, you know, at, at Kellogg, I feel very fortunately at University of Michigan that the leadership is very supportive of um, female careers. Um, and so I, you know, I don't, I certainly don't feel any obstacles at, at a, as a woman in my current position, but I think along the way, it's um, inevitable that you'll, you know, you run into, with all of the education and training, you'll run into some inappropriate comments or behaviors. Um, at very early on, I, I had uh, somebody kind of sit me down and tell me that, and, you know, I, I honestly think a lot of these things come from a place of trying to be helpful, um, but just explaining to me that I would not be able to be a mother and a scientist, that that just really wasn't possible. Um, turned out to not be, I have four kids and I, I am I am doing it. Um, so it's not that it's not, it's challenging is what it is. It's, it's not impossible. Um, and so really those comments aren't so helpful. Um, but you know, all in all, I don't, I don't feel like being a female has, um, has really compromised my career. Um, other just than the challenges of trying to balance everything. Um, you know, I know that I could do more in my career if I wasn't a mom. I know I could do more as a mom if I didn't have a career. So just kind of um, accept, sort of deciding what your boundaries are and what you're willing to accept, you know, I, and, I, and I set those boundaries. They say, I have, this is what I have to do as a mom, you know, and then, you know, and so if I'm going to be successful in my career, I, I have to be able to um, feel comfortable with how I'm taking care of my kids and my family also. And so you sort of have to set those boundaries for yourself. Um, and uh, I, I also just, you know, wanted to say that uh, I think it's so important that women don't, um, you should not, you, the woman as yourself, you should not be the one telling yourself you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to speak to that, um, comment that's been made about women having some fear about pursuing um, science careers or academic careers or whatever it may be. Um, I think there's a fear of failure, of course, everyone has a fear of failure, but you shouldn't be the one telling yourself that you can't do it. There are enough people that, that, that are gonna tell you that, you know, as long as everyone else is being supportive and giving you the opportunity, don't turn it down, you know, take that opportunity. Um, just take it one day at a time, you know, I, I, as I said, right now it's working, I'm doing it. I'm not gonna be the one to tell myself to stop. Absolutely, and you know, I think more and more women and, and young people or, or even women at any stage of their lives or careers, if, they're, if they want to change or if they want to try something new or if there's something that they just wish to actively pursue, you know, just go and do it, I, I think is the message and not to have that fear is, is a really great message to share. And throughout all of that, I could see Suzanne nodding her head and I'm going to come to you next, Suzanne. Um, and I know when I started off as a scientist, the idea of becoming a professor and, and trying to get through that through purely academic means seemed almost impossible. And, you know, I would be a fan of yours, if you like, over the years as well. So I'm, I'm so excited and, and have the great pleasure of, of handing over to you now to share your story with our listeners. Thank you. And thank you for your invitation. So yeah, the, that insecurity that will always remain. Um, I started out as, that was really my first job application as a, as a technician with Franz Kramers. And I'm still there. Um, so he, I started out as a technician and um, at some moment I was working for, for a PhD student, but she was finishing 
And uh, I did take that uh, decision myself to go to, uh, to France to say like, hey, maybe I can do this. Because I was, uh, at that moment, I was uh, scared that there would be an next PhD student who would not give me as much freedom. I was running the project, basically. Um, and Franz said like, yeah, well, we'll have a look. And he, um, uh, well, he, not, he did not allow, but he uh, was the motivator to write a letter to the, to the dean, because normally you cannot do a PhD if you uh, only have a bachelor degree. So he wrote this letter for me to write to the university, say, I, I see this opportunity in her and I will support her. Um, so together with, with Franz, I, I worked, I did my PhD on the cone dystrophies and the genetic part of that. Um, and it was also uh, there that during Arvo, you get to meet all, then you see the females in, in the meetings and you will, you will get to know the field for real. Um, so that is very motivating always to go to these large meetings. Um, but was again, the males in my, in my field who uh, encouraged me to, after your PhD, go abroad, do, that's better for your CV if you want to stay in academic career. So then I, um, uh, I uh, went to New York for two years. And then there I also had again a, a male uh, supervisor that was, uh, without going into detail, that was a, a rough time, but that made me really independent because um, I, I always had the, the, the mentor fronts around me and now it was time to be on my own feet, um, which was in a way was very helpful, but still I reached out to some female collaborators there and I'm still in touch with them uh, to talk about my scientific career because still there's some insecurities, of course. Um, and in 2016, I went back to the Netherlands and to the same lab. And now I have my own lab and I should not say boss to Franz anymore because he's now my equal. <laughs> and um, it was only when I talked with Fiona to um, pre-discuss this, uh, this, this event that I noticed that I only have female PhD students. Um, and that was not done on purpose. Um, I don't know if there's any bias, unexpected bias in myself, but maybe I should reconsider for my next applications that I maybe should get some meals in my group. <laughs> <laughs> and I think within our department, I think there's a quite a, a fair balance in males and females, um, but still I'm scared for this next step and that's probably my own insecurity. Like, will I be good enough? Will I, as a professor, that's still like far away from me. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I think that is, I think with mentorship that might bring me there, but I'm still scared to uh, say that out loud. <laughs> well, I am sure that you have a very long and successful career ahead of you, Thank Suzanne. You. I think there's a, a trend um, coming in the conversation about, you know, successful women being surrounded by successful women. And I am coming to, to Laura next. And I'm just wondering, in your role as a parent and patient advocate, um, is that the same? Are, do, are you experiencing um, a lot of mothers or equal number of mothers and fathers um, leading out in the patient advocacy from your perspective? I actually, in, in my area, because I'm coming from a slightly different perspective, um, and there are, I suppose it is mainly mothers uh, who are in this area, but there are there are fathers too. Uh, but my, my involvement in this area was initially driven because I have a daughter with a CRB1 retinal dystrophy. So she is 14 now and she was diagnosed with CRB1 RP when she was six. So since then, since she was diagnosed, I've been involved in various things, including channeling funding to research project, projects on gene therapy and research projects on understanding the disease, which is so important for CRB1. And I am interested in bringing together CRB1 people to encourage uh, genetic diagnoses to be obtained and recorded on the patient registries. Uh, and so much still needs to be done in this area. And I, I 
trying to do that through a Facebook group called CRB1 Network. And I also focus on encouraging collaboration between uh, research scientists around the world. So information sharing is the way to go. Um, information sharing between scientists is absolutely essential in developing treatments and cures for inherited retinal disease. And uh, quite a lot is happening in this area. So it's very exciting time to be involved in it. Uh, it in terms of my daughter's pathway to diagnosis it was a fairly long and winding one and it took quite a lot of persistence to get to the end result of having a, a full diagnosis so from when my daughter was a baby she would look to the side when picking things up she didn't look at me when we we're in dim light I thought it was odd but that was all um, she was managing fine in terms of her eyesight. So by the time she was two, I thought she might need glasses and we were told she needed glasses for long sightedness. And then she had an eye patch for a squint. But there was no talk about any retinal dystrophy at all at the hospital. I didn't know anything about retinal dystrophy at that time. So she had periodic trips to the hospital to keep a check on her vision and her eyes were examined regularly. And um, we were told that her eyes looked fine and healthy. So my I, that put my mind at rest uh, but then then we noticed nystagmus which is the, the wobbly eye and that was that looked odd I'd never seen that before and uh, she had a brain scan to see if she had a tumor so we went down that path for a while and and that was really worrying and I was delighted when we got all the all clear and I thought that was the end of it but then I, I did become increasingly concerned that she couldn't see at all in dim light. Uh, I mean, she was my first child, so I didn't know what the normals, but it was very, it seemed very strange. She couldn't see at all in dim light. I asked for further tests to be done. And it was only then that she had scans done off her retina. So, um, and, and it was those tests that revealed that she had CRB1RP, so a very distinctive type of retina, sort of thick retina for CRB1. So she was six years old by this stage. And, and luckily at our hospital, they were carrying out research on gene variants and we were offered blood tests to establish the variants and her variants were fully identified within about a year of that time. So part of what I'm focused on now is trying to make that part of diagnosis easier for others by spreading information on how to get a full genetic diagnosis. And I am surprised that there isn't a standardized procedure for this and that patients aren't all given the information they need to get a diagnosis. So what I would love to see um, I'd love to see more on this. I'd love to see further developments in the area of digitizing patient data and giving patients full access to their medical data, um, and which is so important with the scans that you have of, with retinal dystrophies. Yeah, you need those scans to see how the disease progresses over time. It's absolutely essential to have those. If you want to take part in research projects or in, even in gene therapy further down the line. So one thing that I always do is I take a memory stick to my daughter's hospital appointments. Each time I ask um, our doctor to put the scans onto the memory stick and it makes it much easier then to upload medical records onto the patient registry. So that's my retina tracker and there's a CRB1 specific one called, known as cords. So until that time when patient data is properly digitized and made available, available to patients by hospitals, I'll have to continue to do this. And that time can't come soon enough. So that, that, that is my, that's my involvement. And I've just been drawn into it because of the situation we're in. And um, the, the more I've become involved, the more interested I'm in it, I'm, I am in it. And uh, there are so many things to achieve in this area. Uh, in, in terms of female role models, there are so many in this area. They're, they're everywhere. So it's just um, one who springs to mind is, is um, Professor Maria Musaji at UCL and Moorfields, who is incredible. She's carrying out such important research in this area. She, she's also actively involved in encouraging co global collaboration among scientists. Um, not, not everyone is so keen on global collaboration, but she's really leading the way in this area. And it's incredibly important to do that. And at the same time, she has great compassion. She supports patients with, um, with, with such sympathy and compassion, and she's passionate about treating and curing retinal dystrophy. So that's just one person who springs to mind who is a woman. So uh, and I think there, there are just so many inspiring people in this area. And Laura, while, um, while we're on these topics, um, can I ask you, 
are you confident that your messaging and, and your voice is being heard as a patient advocate or you know are you finding any challenges uh in trying to to bring across all of the messages that you've outlined to us there now well i i feel that if you you know put your head above the parapet and you articulate what you need to achieve then then i've always found the help that i need I, and i suppose i'm coming from it from a slightly different angle where i'm asking for information and i'm trying to make things run more smoothly and and people are incredibly helpful when when you ask uh, so in charities and in science also there's, there's a, a strong female contingent um, and i think in this area of retinal dystrophy people are by and large, very caring and keen to help in this this goal of finding treatments and cures. So it's it's just it's it's an incredible area to be in. So it, I don't find it that I have any obstacles at all. <laughs> but um, I'm that's really great to hear. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, it, it's great to have more and more voices sharing that viewpoint and, and stating that fact, because then it will encourage more and more um, individuals, not alone just for their own self-advocacy, but perhaps to join local groups and, um, you know, collaborate and work together to make sure that all of these issues are absolutely addressed. Um, I'm going to come in to uh, one of the questions that we had preempted uh, for this webinar, but also it's actually come in by way of a question, uh, a statement and a question from, from one of our listeners. And it, it focuses on the role of leadership and double standards. So basically the, the listener is looking for advice based on, um, how shall I condense this, to look for advice as to if there is something that the panel suggests uh, this individual can do um, with respect to mentoring students, herself and two male colleagues have similar roles. Uh, when she delegates tasks, there are some of those negative, not so nice comments back. Uh, when the same tasks are delegated by her male counterparts, the students who are all male, uh, have no negative feedback and this was not the case last year when there was a mixture of male and female students in the group. So um, I suppose the first person there I will come to perhaps is uh, Suzanne when it comes to, to leadership and you know this person doesn't say that they are in a lab but when they're, they're talking about students uh, you might be allowed to imagine that they are. Do we have double standards uh, when it comes to, to leadership uh, in scientific roles. And, um, you know, I know with Marina, we discussed her around leadership styles and I'll come to Marina next, but I suppose in the first instance, perhaps Suzanne, you could comment on, you know, what, what if anything, could this uh, individual do or, or say? Um, yeah, that's always a hard question, of course. What can you do? Um, so what I, what I used, and I'm, now I'm just trying to give an example as being myself in, an, in a lower position, talking to somebody who is in a higher position. Um, there I would, um, when, during my time in the US, I, when I found it hard to open up to say something, I was always luckily in the opportunity that I could start my sentence with sorry, sorry for my Dutch directness, but <laughs> and that was for me really helpful to to say the things that I uh, maybe didn't dare to say or I wouldn't dare to say if it was in the Netherlands or with somebody who's from the same country. Um, and the, the double standards, I think. Um, I, th I think they do, they are present uh, to some degree, but I, I find it a little bit hard to say. I, I don't have a lot of experience there with that. I feel that it's because I'm a woman, I'm treated differently. I think you can only find out when you're a male yourself and I'm not. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe Marina then has a better suggestion. Um. <laughs> I unfortunately lack any experience with really being a mentor. I have mentored my peers or 
help them in the in the space of becoming more active advocates. But as you mentioned, Orla, we did talk about leadership styles. And I think what a lot of women are not aware of, it's this is the that leadership sits on a scale. You have very feminine leadership, which we typically associate with mothers. It's very soft, it's caring. You know, you can hurt you can hurt cats with this kind of leadership. It's come along, darling, let, let's go. It's very gentle, but it still has it still has punch, you know. When mum says do your homework, you do it. But then we also have completely on the other side a very masculine, a very fiery, hard style of leadership where it's the person stands at the front of the room and they tell you what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, and how. And there isn't really room for asking. There is not much compassion. And I think, and there is, yeah, always coming back to the question, how do you deal with that? Because you, there was the, the mention of the mixed group. And I wonder if because of that mix of gender in the group already, there was a very natural switch where we find that you can actually get a really lovely balance of feminine and masculine together. And when you can find that balance, that's awesome. And for me, a really excellent example of that is Jacinda Ardern, the current prime minister of New Zealand. She has that push, that power when she says, stay home. But she also has this compassionate softness where she can put on a hijab and walk among victims, or she can make an Instagram video from home going, come on team, we're in this together. That, that, the feel that an auntie brings where she's not enforcing her will, but she's making it very clear that there are boundaries. And so it, it always comes down to what style of leadership is present in your in your situation in your your workspace because i know I, I can speak from experience and say that some workspaces are very male even if there are women working there they have become so used to that masculine approach that they are in spirit a man because they have yeah they don't they don't lean into the the space of empathy that they would normally at home because it's not welcome. Yeah. So I, I, I personally cannot give any specific advice, but I would suggest perhaps leaning into the feminine and listening, actively listening to the complaints or the style of language that is being used by individuals. That so might could be a starting point. So it could be a case that the, the male perspective is more responsive to the, the female style of leadership. Um, Helen, I'm going to come to you on this as well, because, you know, you're, you're a leader in so many uh, areas and across so many fields. And I, on, I have no doubt that, you know, somebody somewhere along the line will have come to seek your advice uh, on leadership. And I'm just wondering, is there anything that you might advise this listener? Um, no, I, I would just make a few comments. It's true that um, the more you, you go up in the leadership uh, uh, mountain, if I can speak that way, uh, it's true that uh, women get rarer. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite astonishing, for instance, in the faculty and the medical schools, etc. Uh, it's still only 10%, for instance, in Strasbourg. Um, and I think this is, it's worrying because uh, there should be more, uh, uh, more, uh, more females. And it's true that the, the type of, um, of uh, leadership can be quite different uh, between a man and a female, in, uh, for instance, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in medicine. Um, do we uh, do we learn to be a leader? Uh, I don't think so. I think we, we become a leader, right. as uh, we would say to in the French. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, uh, voilà, on, uh, yeah, you 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 be, in fact you become a leader by walking as, you, as uh, along the road, and uh, probably um, there would be a, a, a real use 
perhaps to have some training, for instance, to uh, for young female. So how to, if they want to go for leadership, how uh, uh, they may uh, have some various problems uh, that ar arise and uh, how they can uh, how they can how they can move forward. So yeah, this it's um, it's a big subject, I would say. Uh, I would like just to add also, uh, in my career, I have also um, uh, been encountered some discrimination uh, uh, from my some colleagues, uh, 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 male colleagues for, for females. And for me, this is zero tolerance. I cannot just, this is something, uh, I think we are very, we have to be very wise with that. Uh, because it can be very destructive for some of these uh, these females, uh, and yeah, so that's also just a point. Uh, it has to be, um, yeah, we have to be um, very um, aware about that too. If, if we are leading a group, whether there are females and males, uh, just to be wise that this does not happen. Absolutely, and I think that's really important, and I think that's something that can often happen. Um, to women uh, and is that notion of instead of having zero tolerance they they and we I should say as women can tend to say you know we'll we'll let that we'll let that go you know I'm outnumbered here that there's a lot more men in this environment than me um, but absolutely the message is zero tolerance and and don't let it go and I suppose maybe speak to whoever um, the superior is uh, in whether it's a lab group setting or whatever the team group setting there may be. Uh, I'm very conscious of the time and I'm conscious of our panelists time. So I might just give the final word to Christina because all of the roles here um, are really critical, um, critically hanging on the ability to collaborate and communicate and as an absolute leader of patient advocacy in the retina space, Christina has uh, triumphed and led this for many, many decades. So Christina, if you were to, to give advice to anyone who is listening or who might listen at a later time point with respect to pursuing patient advocacy, pursuing scientific research, pursuing clinical practice, what would you say to them? I think uh, this, is for every stage in your life as a woman, first, stay yourself. Don't be afraid of all your own wishes. Don't be afraid to voice your aspirations. Don't be afraid to dream what you could do. And I thought Susanna's experience is a very clear one. She started out as a technician. And when she started out as a technician, it was very clear, I don't do PhD and certainly they don't do the, the work. They just serve the new PhD candidates. And I understand her very well. And she said, I didn't want to be run once again. So dare to dream, dare to ask, and dare to go ahead. But always try to be true to yourself, true to your wishes. And I think it's very important if we face discrimination, we have to have zero tolerance. How we act about it might be very difficult. So I made personally a very good experience not to shout up during a meeting or to stand up during a meeting, but after the meeting, confronting the person in the privacy directly. So not to do shaming. And I think that's very important because with that, the person can also tell what he or she, what he mainly thought. Sometimes it's also women that are discriminating each other. So that you say, and perhaps it's just a misunderstanding, but even if they say it was a misunderstanding, I can guarantee you it won't happen the same way next time because they will think about it. And I can show you just a very small experience I lived. I was invited by the Swiss Council for the Blind to come to a strategic meeting with the executive committee. And everybody, all the six men sitting around the table, 
gave their things and the chair didn't look at me. And then I asked my colleague at the side and said, Fran, are I allowed to speak up or not? And he might sign to the chair that he had to give the word to me. What I did next time, I just made sure to sit aside of the chair. Afterwards, I had no problem. So I call this the African tactic. When you're sitting near to the chair, you get more importance and you get more uh, attention. And this is a very small thing. So communication, learn to do communication skills, learn to do how you act, how you look to the others. And with that, it comes very natural that you will not be overseen. And so just go ahead, teach your daughters and your sons to be not discriminatory. I think for the next generation, this shouldn't be any more a topic. At least that's my dream. That is very well said. And I, I think, you know, th those three take home messages is not to have any fear, to have zero tolerance. And, you know, that excellent life skill. And I, I can tell you, Christina, every single one on the panel was nodding their head and smiling when they said, yes, we need to get closer to the chair. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you to the wonderful women at Retina International that I work with day to day as well. Um, just to give you all a mention and a, and a shout out uh, in association with this uh, International Women's Day event. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye-bye, everybody, and take care. Take bye -bye. care. Bye. bye. bye.